Welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club. Uh, my name is Keith Bredge. I'm the Hong Kong Bureau Chief for the New York Times, and I'll be your host tonight on behalf of the Board of Governors. Before I introduce our guest for this evening, uh, please, two reminders, as always. One, please turn off your cell phones now. Uh, we do uh, record all of these events. The movie, it's, the documentary itself, will not be on the... Uh, the video or on our website for copyright reasons, but the discussion and so forth and his very interesting questions will be on the website, and we hate for people not to be able to hear that for our many uh, people who now watch us online uh, because somebody's cell phone goes off. So at least mute it, but preferably turn it off entirely. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our guest for this evening, Mike Chinoy. Now, probably Mike is better known here than almost anybody else we could have up on this stage. This is the He's not only a former longtime uh, CNN foreign correspondent based here uh, for many years, traveling all over Asia, including to Iraq. He's also somebody who has been making this wonderful series that uh, we're pleased to show the next installment of tonight regarding American foreign correspondents since the Chinese Civil War all the way up to the present. Tonight is the sixth installment in that series. He has four more that he's finished, and we hope to, to show them as well here later. Uh, you, some of you may have already seen many, if not all, of the previous five. One of the ones that particularly drew a lot of comment was the one that he showed almost exactly 12 months ago today. Actually, I believe it was June 3rd last year, which was his Tiananmen Square episode. And he's now selling copies of that on DVD at the entrance here of how American foreign correspondents covered Tiananmen Square. So those of you who might wish, wish to do so can buy copies of that one. On the way out, all the proceeds go to the Institute at the University of Southern California that is uh, financing this series of documentaries. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike. Uh, tonight's DVD, tonight's uh, documentary, I should add, is not among those there. So the table has last year's Tiananmen Square uh, DVDs. With that, I'd like to introduce Mike, who's, whose documentary tonight is on the 1990s. Mike? Thanks very much, Keith. Uh, it's, it's really special to be able to uh, share this, this film. It's kind of amazing. We, this is the sixth one that, we, that we've shown here in this project, which we actually began working on in the beginning of 2009. So it's taken a very long time um, to pull this together. But this project, Assignment China, um, is intended to be a kind of documentary uh, history of American journalists in China from the Chinese Civil War in the mid-1940s all the way up to the present day. I think a lot of you have, have seen some of these episodes, but the basic idea here is that the way in which the American media have covered China over all these decades has really been instrumental in shaping not only the way the American public look at China, but given the cloud of the American media, uh, U.S. coverage of China has had a huge impact in shaping perceptions of the People's Republic all over the world. And yet, most people know very little about uh, how journalists uh, do their job if you're not in the news business. And even for people in the news business, what's been interesting to me in putting this together is how people of more recent vintage know so little about the people who came before doing a similar kind of work. So we think that there's real value in trying to have put together essentially a kind of a uh, oral history or a self-autobiography in which the people who have covered China over all these decades tell their own story and those of you who watch can get a sense of who these people were, uh, what they did, how they did it, what it was like, what were the challenges they faced. Um, there's a, Sometimes I always felt when I was a journalist that what the reporters said to one another at the bar at the end of the day after we filed our stories was more interesting and more insightful and infinitely more entertaining than what was in the actual stories themselves. And we've tried to capture some of that here. So each of these films is designed to, to give you a sense of kind of being a fly on the wall as reporters live through and try to make sense of and cover and report uh, epic historic events. Uh, this film um, looks at the 1990s, uh, which is an extremely interesting period which began in the kind of dark aftermath of Tiananmen Square and ended with uh, the China boom in full force 
uh, a, a, a decade later. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's a, a kind of really important turning point and there are a lot of very interesting issues um, that, uh, that it raises. So with that, uh, we'll show the film. We'll certainly have time for discussions and questions afterwards. The film runs about uh, uh, 50 minutes or so, so if we can turn the lights down, uh, we'll get started. You turn the lights. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, that was uh, wonderful to watch again, uh, like your previous episodes. Uh, do you want to make any just brief remarks, or should I throw well, it straight up into questions? Up, yeah. Okay. Uh, who would like to first ask the first question? Please identify yourselves. Okay. Well, oh, David, please. Hi, uh, David O'Rear. I was struck by two things. One was even as late as 1999, Tiananmen is, is clouding everything that journalists think. And, and this made me wonder, uh, is our media serving us well? Uh, and the second one was the story that was absolutely overwhelming us here in Hong Kong the day after the handover was the collapse of the Thai bot and the entire Asian financial crisis uh, and waiting for China to devalue. Is this never high on the agenda of, of journalists in China? I, th I, I think apart from sort of dedicated financial journalists, it wasn't particularly high uh, on, the, on the agenda of, of, of most of the mainstream reporters. And on the Tiananmen anniversary, um, I think you're right. It, it, you know, Tian Tiananmen is this amazing moment that sort of seared in itself into the public consciousness. Um, I mean, I was, got sick of it after a while, not least because June 4th is my birthday, and for, you know, more than a decade I had to work on my birthday doing Tiananmen anniversary stories. I mean, almost literally till, till the time I, I, I left CNN. Um, and it just really, I think that's something that reporters wrestle with, because Yes, the media fixates on it. At the same time, it is still an incredibly sore point in China. And it, it's not that the media fixates on it at this time every year that explains the, the, the way in which the Chinese, uh, you know, the slightest mention of it triggers this incredible overreaction, which suggests that beneath the surface, it still resonates. My, my old professor, uh, history professor in college, uh, Jonathan Spence, had this line right after it happened. He said, June 4th is a date that's going to haunt authoritarian governments in China for centuries. Uh, so it's a, it's a sort of two-sided dynamic. I do think there, there, there is a point where it's like, enough already. I mean, it's, what, 26 years now? Um, I got emails earlier this week from media saying, can we interview you about Tiananmen anniversary? Um, but on the other hand, when you dig beneath the surface, it's a, there's, there's scar tissue, but when you, if you peel the scar tissue back, it's a wound that's not healed yet. And so, you know, tr finding that balance is, is, is tricky. But it did get to a point where, after a while, you know, every spring you had to do it. And certainly, the 10th anniversary is an absolutely valid journalistic hook. And certainly, first, second, third anniversaries, it was still so raw. I'm not sure the 26th anniversary, but it does say something both about the enduring power of those images and the fact that it's still a not healed wound inside China within certain important circles. Mark. Uh, Mark Michelson. Thanks a lot, Mike. That, having lived through that a lot, I, uh, I recognized a lot of that, and I think you captured some a couple of important points in addition to the, uh, some of the things that, that you know, were pretty strong, the, certainly the awful parts of what you talked about. But one was how well China was doing and how that really wasn't covered particularly. And I, was, I did a lot of work with the American Chamber. We went to Washington every year from 1990 onwards and also to Beijing every year talking about MFN and talking about others, not because we agreed with what China had done, 
but because we saw some positive parts of actually changing the Chinese economy, recognizing the problems in factories like toy factories and, and clothing and so on. But in many of the factories, it was much better conditions that wouldn't have existed in China elsewhere. And you know, there, were, there were ways out, and it was, was forward for the economy. So, so that had some effect, but especially in the US politically, where it was a big deal. It was a, it was, it was a big deal. But it was, uh, it, it, was, it was an overwhelming problem. And I think you, you rightly said it was never really recognized. Well, I mean, I, I thought by the know, outdoors. St Stapleton Roy, his observation is really true. That, that yeah. there, that, and I remember having these conversations with him and with, with others about, because the, the perception of China uh, shaped a lot by the media, uh, which in turn was shaped by China's own behavior, was increasingly at variance with the experience of China that your average foreign, American, whatever, Western visitor would see. You know, you would show, if you, by 93, 94, 95, you would come to Beijing, you were going to see tanks on the streets and people being shot. You were going to see this kind of go-go. Um, and I remember at CNN, I mean, one of the challenges for a TV correspondent where you have to deal in images was how do you do this and we used to debate how often do you use the shot of the guy in front of the tank. I mean every time you have a line in a story about human rights do you put the guy in front of the tank. Um, and, 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 and I struggled to try and find a, an image that worked. I remember in the end using, they built the, what was then the biggest McDonald's in the world at that corner across from the Beijing Hotel. So I remember in any number of stories using that to illustrate, you know, at the corner where the man stopped the tank, there is the biggest McDonald's in the world. Um, but look, let's face it, a McDonald's is not going to compete in emotional power with the image of the guy in front of the tank. So it is, a, it is a problem, and I do think to some degree it led to this kind of out of whack perception of China. And, you know, but I, and I think in a lot of ways, I mean, we were just talking during dinner, I mean, the, the, you know, China is this paradox. And, and, and getting your head around a place which can have, you know, punk rockers giving concerts and dissidents languishing in jail at the same time, often just, you know, right around the corner from each other, uh, is really hard. And it's really hard to convey the, the, this kind of opposites all going on at the same time in the same place. And how do you distill that into a two-minute TV spot or a 900-word story for the New York Times or, you know, uh, wire service story is a real challenge, and it's, I think, in a slightly different way, but similarly to even today, it's, a, it's really a challenge for reporters trying to get that. Just to add a quick anecdote, which people maybe don't know, in the 1990s there were a couple of very hardline Chinese officials in Hong Kong who behind the scenes sounded like Zhu Rongji. I mean, it sort of amazed you. They would ask us in and then they would promote us bringing in foreign investment in China, where publicly it sounded yeah. like just the opposite. Very interesting. Up here, please. That was great. Thank you. Um, I work in financial markets, and you know, one of the things that's so striking with many of my clients, especially on the East Coast, is what explains by certain publications that lean, that are very right-leaning, an unforgiving, unquenching, nonstop, un, you know, un, un, unbiased criticism of China. Uh, you know, and, and so. It's doing a great, a great. I think it's doing a great disservice uh, because when you're looking at, at, at <coughs> financial markets, you, you see even now the stuff that's going on with China is is astounding reform going on, and yet we we still see. A, in fact, I was at lunch today with a very large fund, and he was saying, "Why on earth are we getting bombarded in our Boston office by people who see China as you know needing garlic and a crucifix in order to deal with them?" And so, how do you explain that? That, that negativity about China, the more you travel east, where is this coming from? Well, I don't know. I, I, my base in the States is California, and even though I'm from Massachusetts, I can't explain the East Coast. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's a very complicated dynamic because, you know, you've got resident journalists in Beijing who get up every morning and have to do a story. And part of what I hope comes across in this film and what I hope more generally we can convey in this series is, you know, the ex experience of, of actually doing this work 
Uh, and somehow there's this huge disconnect between what the news consumer, when they pick up the paper, go online or turn the TV on, sees, and how it gets there. And somehow people think this is part of like a plan or there's a consistent line. The journalist wakes up, it's like, okay, anything interesting going on, anything that's dramatic, uh, anything that's controversial, anything that has kind of wow factor that's going to generate readers, that's going to pique the you know, the interest of the editors that I can do and meet my deadline, that I can get the right quote for, can I get a picture of it, how do I get it out? Um, and so, you know, you're doing the kind of day-to-day, -day. obviously in your back of your mind, you're thinking, how does this fit into the broader understanding of China? But that's what the daily, re new, the, the reporter doing their job every day is doing. But you also have, um, uh, I think to some degree what journalists cover is shaped by what's on the U.S.-China diplomatic agenda and not in the sense that the American government tells journalists what to cover, but American government is making a fuss about human rights and it is a contentious issue in the relationship. As a journalist covering what's in the news, you're going to end up covering it. So right now, Chinese behavior in the South China Sea is contentious issue, the American Secretary of Defense just gave a big speech about it. So that's going to get covered. So that's one part of it. Part of it also is that, you know, financial markets are important in some ways, but they're, they're not as sexy as some of the other things, and you're competing for space and airtime and so on. It's it, the old saying about the two things you don't want to see the inside of are a newsroom and a sausage factory, and for the same reason, you don't really want to know what goes into the process, because it's a very messy, uneven, human process, even if the final product has this aura of, you know, all-knowing, whatever. And so I think, I mean, I mean, some of the other journalists might also have views about it, but I think that's, that's part of the reason for this. And obviously things that are powerful and dramatic and resonate, and what people talk about over the dinner table after they've seen it on TV or read it, more often than not are going to be the stuff that's not what you're talking about. And that's a challenge for journalists to try and capture that. I don't know if you, I mean, you guys are covering China today, if you want to have any additional. Over here, please. Is it really not a question? I just wanted to comment on the, Mike, you said a little earlier about the fixation of foreign correspondents about June 4th. Um, I used to work for an American company running China. Uh, we have about 15 to 20,000 employees. Uh, up until my retirement in 2008, I actually went back out of retirement, lived in Shanghai for a year in 2013. All the people that I run into, our own employees, business associates, and so forth, uh, my experience has been none of them are afraid to talk about June 4th, but very, very few of them are interested to talk about June 4th. And people that are sort of in their 30s, only have a vague idea of what June 4th was. Uh, some don't even know about it. So I think China has, the, the, the overwhelming majority of China's population has moved on, moved on from June 4th a long time ago. There's only foreign correspondences that keep fixated about it. Uh, and maybe a little bit answered that gentleman's earlier question. Unfortunately, bad news sells. Good news does not sell. So. If you, if you report a good story about good things in China, nobody cares. If you report a negative story, it sells. But that's not only China. In America, the same thing. Yeah. Bad news sells. Yeah. Well, you know, when a plane lands and everybody goes home, it's not news. When the plane crashes and everybody dies, it's news. But it's, I mean, I think there's a lot of truth in what you said. But at the same time, I think most people in China, you're right, spend very little time thinking about June 4th. Um, I don't know whether that's because they've moved on or because the government has done everything in its power to blot it from their consciousness. And, but the fact is it's still sensitive. It's sensitive enough that this elderly woman journalist, Gao Yu, I think, um, or, or other people were picked up. There was a little private commemoration event earlier and this spring. People are going to jail for it. So on the one hand, the vast, vast majority of Chinese, that was a very long time ago. It's ancient history. They don't know about it. Um, 
I'm sure, you know, there were people who lived through it who know about it, but probably don't talk about it. Um, but it still cuts to the heart of a lot of questions about political legitimacy, and that's part of the reason if they really moved on, they might be more open in allowing people to, to sort of talk about it, which I think, in my own view, is a way it, in the long run to, in fact, move on. But that being said, I do think there is something excessive about over and over and over. Um, but journalists pick on Anna Burgess, and, the, and, and, and so that it's not that surprising. And also, I think part of this is the, the, inter, the interaction of journalists and the authorities. Because if the authorities were less heavy-handed, um, every time this came up, it it would it would mit, it would sort of mitigate or or reduce the sense among a lot of journalists that wow, this is still really sensitive, and because journalists like to zero in on sensitive things, so it's partly also the interplay of the authorities um, and journalists, and that raises I think a broader issue, which is that the interaction of of journalists and the Chinese system is still very, even though in many ways it's certainly better than when I first went there, um, but the experience of journalists interacting with the Chinese system and business people interacting with the Chinese system or tourists is, is generally much more negative. And so journalists, if the, I mean, I just read today or yesterday, you know, about I think a TV crew was beaten up. Um, there is a kind of thuggishness that's part, it's not all of, the, but it's part of the Chinese system, which journalists face more often and more pervasively than other foreigners in China. And I think that also shapes the kind of cynicism and negativity. Journalists, if you're treated that way, if you're followed, hassled, blocked, thwarted, beaten, harassed, intimidated, um, it shapes your view of the system. and in that respect, it's self-defeating to the interests of the system. And, I mean, Jim McGregor, who's in this film, left the Wall Street Journal to become the corporate representative for Dow Jones in the mid-90s. And he talks about how his, his dealings in China changed overnight. Suddenly people would talk to him, suddenly he could travel easily, suddenly he wasn't being followed, being treated as a spy. He had a much more positive experience with China. And, and, and it shaped his attitude accordingly. But that was not the case when he was a journalist. So I think that's also another ingredient in this mix. OK. Another one here, please. Hi, Nick Thompson. No affiliation. But I was working in a place called Baoding in the mid-90s. Oh, you picked the garden spot in China. <laughs> And my wife came out to visit me, and uh, she wanted to go and visit a local school. So it was organized through the right channels, and we went to visit a university in the evening, just to arrange for my wife just to visit a school, because she was a teacher. And when she eventually got to see uh, the school, it, she went via the university. And the people there were only too happy to tell her all the documents they'd managed to save during the Cultural Revolution. So is it just a matter of time and that people will come out of the woodwork in as many years from now to say what they were doing at the time of Tiananmen Square? I don't know, but I think, I think history is very complicated in China and it's very, very sensitive. So even today, what happened in the Great Leap Forward, what happened in the Cultural Revolution, um, there are still real limits on, on you know, public discussion, what can be written, what can be published. Um, so it's, 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 it's very, very complicated. Um, and, and, you know, it's sort of there in, you know, bubbling away somewhere. You don't often see it, but it's, it's not gone. And, and I think, you know, the, given all of the policy flip-flops that have happened in China and the abrupt shifts and so on, uh, with the same party still in control, its relationship to history is a complicated one. At, at that same uh, meeting, the same time I was working at Baoding, we were asked along to go to the English evening at a university there. And uh, my wife and I were split up. She was going to talk to a group about uh, things like the royal family and so on. And I started getting asked questions about 
why did Britain take Hong Kong? And I said, well, it was similar to the Chinese walking in and taking Tibet. And within seconds, there were some uniformed people coming towards the front of the class. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Great anecdote, Rob. Um, I just wanted to say that I think that these discussions are so familiar. I didn't have a chance to tell you this, Mike. Last time your film was shown here, uh, the previous film, at, at our dinner table was a, a young woman uh, from China, mainland China, who had been to university in, in London and was very proud of how sophisticated she was and how much she knew about Chinese history, some of which she you know, talked about learning in the West. She was incensed when the tank man was shown because she said, the foreign media has done a terrible disservice. They never told us that you know, this guy was fine. And we all looked at her like, what are you talking? The whole story is that the tank doesn't run over the guy. Like, that's what's important about it as, well, it's one of many things important about it as a story. And she had missed that, even though mm -hmm. she thought she knew about the incident. So just to your point about it really is hard to know history in China, even if you, you know, think you have known it. And so there are shades of truth, and, mm -hmm. and what you're showing tonight blends from history to mm -hmm. first, you know, yeah, and I, I mean, I've, I've used these films in courses that I've taught that have had a lot of students from China, and, you know, you can just he, you know, hear the jaws dropping because it's a side of their history that they don't learn at home. Do we have any questions out on the veranda that I'm not seeing? No? I just want, before, before we finish, to acknowledge Tim Schwartz, who's sitting back there, who was my producer in Beijing for much of the 90s and beyond and who lived through a lot, a lot of this and, and uh, I suspect this stirs up some, some, some memories of uh, uh, what, what it was like back then. Okay, well, oh yes, Nick. I was just wondering, you, uh, you got quite a brain's trust in, the, in that film we just watched, I mean, you know, James Baker and uh, quite a brain's trust. A wealth of experience and, and I guess views on, on China and, and we touched on this just before you started speaking about you know, whether you know, you'd ask them sort of to cast forward and, and, and I wonder if there is a, a dichotomy between what the, the journalists were thinking and what people like you know, James Baker and Stapleton Roy were, were also thinking or whether they're kind of combined in their view these days about where China's going. Well. It's very hard, I mean, you know, I learned through many years of covering China that the best way to look like a fool is to predict what's going to happen. Um, one of the great benefits of not working at CNN anymore is I don't have to embarrass myself in front of millions of people by being wrong about China. It's really hard to figure. Um, I think, you know, people like State Roy and Baker were, were policy folks, and so they had a different set of interests. Uh, and they dealt with the Chinese system in a in a different way, um, and it you know generalizing is very hard. But I I, I think uh, most journalists uh, by definition are cynical and uh, mistrusting of authority and mistrusting of what officialdom tells you. And I think what one of the challenges in China is uh, sort of it's it's an incredibly hard story to cover. Um, it's much more open than it was. It's much easier to get information. It's much easier to travel around, but there's still large areas that are off limits, uh, and there are all sorts of pressures that are brought to bear that make it harder. And it's also extremely challenging to try to generalize about a country of 1.3 billion people. So, um, I mean, I think that being said, uh, people have very, very uh, mixed views, China's, myself included. China's is a very sort of complicated moment now, and I think, you know, it's good to argue one of the questions that, that I think people wrestle with is, is what we're seeing now just to sort of, you know, you've had this shift back and forth ever since, uh, you know, the late 70s, you know, opening, tightening, opening, tightening. Uh, are we, or are we seeing just another variant of that? Is this going to become the new normal with a much, much tighter uh, social, political, ideological control? So 
you know, I don't, I don't, I, 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 I honestly don't know, and I think you'd get a variety of opinions if you, if you polled reporters. Okay. Well, just out of curiosity, uh, just in the last year, I guess, for the first time, people really are needing military expertise in covering China with questions like how are they putting multiple independent reentry vehicles on ICBMs and artillery deployment in the South China Sea and a lot of the buildup. Uh, do you see the direction of the China story changing from away from, or maybe continued emphasis on human rights, but more towards a Cold War style, almost revisited uh, military uh, uh, buildup clash well, of superpowers issue. Well, I think I mean I think there there is no I mean in my in my own view I think that the Chinese government has made a significant sort of course correction in the last few years. At, um, which I would date really from the financial crisis and China weathering it in much better shape than the West and this fueling a sense among many uh, top in China that uh, the decline of the United States and of the West is inexorable and that China's rise is therefore inevitable and China could discard this kind of, you know, go talk quietly and just focus on domestic development and. Uh, it has legitimate interests, and it's time to flex its muscles and get everybody to uh, take China's interests into account. And I think if you add to that uh, the sense that, that in the absence of anybody believing in socialism or communism anymore, that nationalism is the unifying glue, and the Communist Party has, has very consciously uh, inculcated the population in that, sometimes in very extreme Ways and so I think what you're getting is is a a, a much more internationally assertive China, um, much less willing to sort of tiptoe around and much more prepared to say, you know, we're big, we're powerful, these are our rights, and we've got the clout to assert them. What are you going to do about it? And I think that's the that's the reality, and and that's being combined with this very complex dynamic internally, where on on the one end you have extremely uh, m much greater uh, controls over, you know, intellectuals, the press, uh, 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 you know, uh, the NGOs, the, the whole, whole range where we see this very, very strong tightening. Um, even while Xi Jinping does seem to be serious about certain kinds of economic reforms, but not reforms in the sort of sense that reform means liberalization, but reform means fixing the system so it works better to further perpetuate the Communist Party's rule. And so um, I think China's relations with the region and beyond are going to get very bumpy, and it's not necessarily Cold War mentality. I think that's just a reality, but certainly I, one did not need to know about these kinds, you know, the military things in the same way when I was there, but it's 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 a different it's a different world now. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We try to give our guests always something to remember the club by. Now I fear you probably have a collection of FCC ties by now. Yeah, I but do. <laughs> we I hope they at least picked a different color for it this oh, time. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Thank well, you very thank much. You. <laughs>